So I am so excited. I've always wanted to do a geo hug talk on dinosaurs. So thank you so much to Russell Mears for helping me with this one. I'm thrilled that we have Robin McKenzie and Mel Milkinson from the Aramunga Natural History Museum joining us today. So for the last 36 years, Robin has been a Southwestern Queensland landholder, helping to run a fourth generational family business on 110,000 hectares of merino sheep and cattle grazing land. She's now a field paleontologist and has been lucky enough to have one of Australia's richest dinosaur fossil fields in her backyard, so where she has now developed the major outback Eramunga Natural History Museum. And Mel Wilkinson has a 38-year career as an excavation geologist in the oil and gas industry and has experience in both conventional and unconventional resources. He is interested in all things rock-related and the stories that they tell and has a passion for field geology, evolution, and of course, dinosaurs. So Mel has been involved in the Aramunga Natural History Museum since 2007. And as one of the directors is passionate about understanding the Cretaceous Winton formation. So it is going to be incredible hearing from them today. I'm going to quickly pass to Russell Mears, who was the catalyst to making this talk happen. So thank you so much, Russell. Thanks, Jess, and thanks everybody for coming along and joining the talk. This talk is going to be an absolute cracker. I just want to give you a little bit of background <laughs> as to how it came about. Back in June last year, my wife and I decided to escape COVID in Sydney and take our camper trailer to outback Queensland to see the Channel Country, go to the Big Red Bash in Birdsville. And we'd heard about this little town called Eramanga, somewhere up there that had this little museum that had a few dinosaurs. So we had to cross to that. And I can tell you, once I got there, I was like a kid in a candy shop. What, what Robin and her team have done there is totally amazing. The passion that she has brought to, from being a grazier to developing this museum and advancing it in so many different ways over the last 10 years or so is so impressive with people like Mel to help her along the way. Uh, the collection up there, the research they do, the way they educate tourists along the way is just fantastic. And uh, I just really take, take my hat off to all of them up there. And they've got a fair bit of international recognition as well. And I don't want to take your thunder away, Robin, but, <laughs> but last year, National Geographic did a list of the tep 10 top dinosaur discoveries last year. And, num and Cooper, which they're going to talk about, was the number two in that list. Secondly, I looked on TripAdvisor to see how popular and what sort of comments there were about Aramanga Natural History Museum. And of 110 comments, 106 said excellent. And I think um, a few more said very, very good and one poor. But of that ratio, it's fantastic. The comments are just amazing. And thirdly, they've got an award-winning documentary film on the history of planet Earth that they show to all visitors to the place. And that is a superb documentary. It's currently in-house and at some point it'll be released, but it covers the story of planet Earth from the Big Bang onwards in a layman sort of way. And I would recommend that everybody puts Aramanga Natural History Museum on their bucket list to visit. Over to you, Robin and Mel. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. What a wrap. <laughs> thank you, Jess. Um, uh, and thank you um, to Russell as well. I had a look at a few of the past presentations and um, I was a bit overwhelmed actually thinking that I was actually going to be talking to a group of so highly educated people. Um, I felt I was definitely punching way above my weight. Nonetheless, I'm quite honoured to be invited by Russell. Thank you again very much for this opportunity to present to you my story um, about why the discovery of the Cretaceous dinosaurs near Aramanga in southwest Queensland have led to the development of the Aramanga Natural History Museum in the Australian outback. Um, I will do um, my story first um, and then Mel's going to follow on and do a more technical geological version of the history out here as well. Historically, the major Cretaceous dinosaur discoveries in Australia have been focused around um, Dinosaur Cove in Victoria, in Victoria and then Central West Queensland, even though the same fossiliferous Cretaceous clays from the Winton Formation extended well south into southwest Queensland, the thinking at the time that in the paleontological community was that it was too far south and the Winton formation was too chemically altered and heavily, wind, uh, heavily weathered to have preserved any viable fossils. Very little, um, if any, prospecting um, for Cretaceous dinosaurs had ventured into southwest Queensland 
before 1997. And at that point, um, there was a team that came from America, um, the scientists that came from America and the Queensland Museum, um, and they came out and they um, earmarked certain places that hadn't been prospected before. Uh, in, that, in that group, incidentally, was actually Joe's, um, Mel's wife, Jo, who is actually the senior fossil technician of the Queensland Museum. So we have since developed a long, lifelong relationship with both Mel and Jo. In 2004, uh, Cretaceous dinosaur sites were discovered west of Eremanga in southwest Queensland. It was, first, it was the first of um, many sites to come, this first site, although it still took some time to shape the, the um, preconceived perception um, that this region was unable to preserve viable dinosaur bone other than probably as an opal. These new dinosaur fossil fields were heavily overlain by gas exploration and production leases. As we discovered these new dinosaurs, um, fossil fields, and they all each field actually had um, several sites within it, and plotted them on the geology map. Um, it became apparent that they were all associated with the Mount Hout anticline, and um, I'm pretty sure Mel will go into that in some detail a bit later on because that falls very heavily into his lap. <laughs> the same geological forces that created the Mount Hout anticline created the opportunity for viable gas production um, deep within the Cooper Basin and also pushed the rich fossiliferous layer within the Winton Formation towards the surface. The self-mulching effect, which you, I've, in the photo there, if you have a closer look at that, that's sort of my attempt at trying to explain that to you, um, of the um, black soil, which is a combination of reworked sediments um, coming from the Winton Formation blow, blown in and create and, and plants and everything that sort of worked, made up that black soil layer. Um, top these Cretaceous age soils where the bone beds are. And basically as it, as it swells and when it gets wet and it dries, it, it, it pulls up the bones from the bone bed, which is that paler color underneath and brings it to the surface of the soil. Um, and then that's where we see these broken up fragments sitting on top of the ground. And until you actually know what they look like, you would not even bother um, stopping and having a look at it. So um, although my family lived on uh, this property for 85 years, oh, well, it wasn't 85 years back then, but it was, you know, 70 odd years when we found the first dinosaur, um, no one knew what to look for. So no one knew um, we, you know, what, what the bone looked like on the ground. So it took some time before that point was actually achieved. So um, this new dinosaur frontier now opened up many new possibilities for both science and the Southwest community. So this photo is very typical of the landscapes that we work within, not a tree in sight. Um, you know, if you can imagine back 95 million years ago, a very, very different environment. It would have been an, like an open floodplain, um, like the Cooper Creek, but all, all year round, like just um, masses of vegetation, lots of water, lots of deltas, and these massive giants um, walking through it, this very muddy, wet environment. Today, um, this is a relatively dry year when this photo was taken. Um, it can look browny red, it can look emerald green. Um, and it's, it's quite, quite um, staggering, the contrast that we get out there. Now, this large back of our Outback Australia has had a real opportunity to become a major contributor towards the Australian dinosaur fossil heritage and the history books which will be subsequently, subsequently written about that. These new Aramanga dinosaur sites represent one of the richest dinosaur fossil fields in Australia. It was important to rescue our paleontological heritage and through the conservation process transform it into a comprehensible, informal education resource to help tell the story of the continuation, continuing evolution of the earth. And what Russell referred to before with the um, video clip, that's just the beginning of one of our uh, ways of um, bringing that information to the public through the museum. 
So the first um, systematic or organised or official um, dinosaur digs in, in the southern Aramanga Basin began on, on the Aramanga dinosaur site. So the first one was actually back in 2007 and that, and that was um, on, at Cooper's site. So Australotitan, Cooperensis, as we now know, know him, um, back in 2007. This actual image here is not at that site, that is of another dinosaur nicknamed Zach. So the first site, as I said, was Australotitan. And Australotitan, for those of you who don't know about Australotitan, um, is Australia's largest dinosaur and one of the world's largest dinosaurs as well. Subs subsequent sites have uncovered uh, articulated and associated skeleton of one of the most complete large sauropods in Australia. And that's this one we're looking at in the screen here. That's nicknamed Zach. And um, Zach is pretty jolly special, beautifully preserved. Um, and it's really rare to find um, skeletons so closely associated and, and even articulated. Uh, we found also the first sauropod trample zone, um, which is a type of dinosaur trackway uh, back in 2008. And it also had the trampled remains of another dinosaur embedded in it. Now, I've done a bit of research and I've traveled a little bit before we got shut down overseas to other dinosaur museums and asked a lot of questions about whether there's other trackways with um, fossilized remains directly associated. Um, not a lot of answers forthcoming, maybe one, maybe two, but not, nothing really very conclusive. Um, so it seems like it is quite a rare thing to actually have dinosaur, and this is not just a bone, it's actually a crushed remains of a skeleton, um, it, it, to have them actually embedded and that directly associated with the trackway is actually very rare from what I'm seeing worldwide. And also we found um, in the trackway um, the first complete titanosaur teeth at the time as well. And since then, we've been working on many other sites, um, including the one we're working on at the moment. Um, and these are representing some of the most highly concentrated beds of dinosaur fossils that we've found in Australia. So it's very exciting stuff when you go on digs out here. So the evolution of the Aramanga Natural History Museum was definitely not a premeditated and definitely not as one, a result of one of those um, think tanks we all have to save a community or to save, in this case, the Southwest region from economic and population um, decline. The museum vision was instinctively developed when the first Aramanga dinosaurs were made to ensure that these priceless fossils remain within the community. This extraordinary fossil richness represented regional assets that could potentially bring economic, social, and scientific benefits to the Southwest Queensland region. The Outback Gondwana Foundation Limited, which both Mel and I are directors of, um, was founded in 2008 to support the scientific community who wish to promote and protect the paleontological activity in the region. One of its primary object objectives was the creation of an enabling environment for the receipt of the fossil material discovered so that it was not transferred to institutions outside the region. And this was really important that we had this public company, this, this structure or this um, governance that, that in place to hold these internationally significant um, fossils. With great vision for the future, the Outback and Wider Foundation uh, was founded and plans to develop the Aramanga Natural History Museum were well underway. For 10 years, the Aramanga Natural History Museum operated out of a field station on the landholder's property. So you can see that one quite clearly on your slide there. We, we actually thought we had the largest dinosaur prep lab in, in Australia. I think maybe we might have at the time. <laughs> We were very happy with what we had then at that point, um, but there was a problem. We weren't open to the public, and so there was. We were, I was constantly writing applications, trying to to get funding to um, get a facility that was open to the public. This shed um, that we built was on the landholder's property, um, and it was built to begin the fossil preparation and safely house the dinosaur bones until this dedicated museum facility was finally funded and built. In 2015, 
um, funds were raised to build um, a large shed on the Aramaga, Nat the Aramaga Natural History Museum workshop on the museum reserve just outside Aramanga. So we'd managed to get land excised off the Aramanga Common. Um, that wasn't an easy process. It took many years to do that, believe it or not. There's not a lot of land out here that you can do this with, which is, seems quite crazy. Um, so the workshop acted as an interim museum interface until stage two, the dedicated museum galleries and facilities were funded. By 2020, we had built both the front visitor reception gallery and the back research facility of the museum. And we are continuing to try and raise funds for the middle section, the dinosaur galleries, to join the museum together as one building. Now, this is, one of these galleries is very large. Um, it, it will actually house the full-size skeleton of Australoventer, Australotitan, I should say, um, Kufarensis. And um, so it's a very large gallery. So nothing comes with a cheap price tag in the world of dinosaurs. We actually have the re re reproduced skeleton already um, in storage at the museum at the moment. So we, we're trying to raise money to build a home for Australotitan, basically. Within the Southwest community, the word was beginning to get out um, that the region was to have its own natural history museum a dedicated repository for its own fossil heritage. Landholders with, with significant fossil sites on their properties approached us uh, to work on their sites and, donate the, and then donate the fossils to the Aramanga Natural History Museum collection. Holding these fossils locally was very important to these landholders. And in fact, um, they probably wouldn't have come forward with their sites without that um, assurance. Sites from all across um, Southwest Queensland region are now registered localities within the Aramanga Natural History Museum. And over the 18 years that we've, we've been do, working on um, the fossil heritage from this region, um, we've done so many public engage, so much public engagement, just trying to educate people about um, their, what to look for. Uh, what potentially they have in their regions and also to inform them of what we can do and what work we can provide to help them um, preserve and um, care for their fossil heritage. The true diversity and richness of the fossil heritage from this region um, was only just beginning to come to light. With the fossil, with fossils of extinct plants from different ages, um, marine reptiles, extinct bivalves from di different ages, megafauna, microfauna, turtles, and trackways spanning a time frame of 50,000 years through to 120 million years. The Aramanga Natural History Museum is now considered by paleontologists to represent the most significant collection of fossils from Central Australia including type and significant specimens of dinosaurs. Um, on the screen here, you can obviously see very large dinosaur bones and they're, they're um, the femur from Australotitan. Um, you can see a, a mandible or a lower jawbone of a, a Diprotodon nicknamed Kenny. I'm not sure whether you can see the megalania tooth or not, but there's a megalania tooth tucked in there um, from the six metre long um, goanna that existed um, alongside the, the uh, megafauna back about 50,000 years ago. Um, but also you can see this little vertebrae in the middle of the screen. Now that little vertebrae is the size of a sugar grain. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the, the microfossils that we're finding in the sediments around uh, the actual fossils that we're um, digging up in the Yulo area, the, the, the megafauna, they're rather beautiful. The economic and social benefits of the museum um, have been now clear to see with the tourist population um, growing on average for the past five years at 46% um, annually. And that, I'll stress that's on an average. The two new, uh, new um, tourism businesses and accommodation providers have opened and the profile of the region has been significantly lifted after the massive scientific announcement of Australotitan cooperensis in June 2021. 
over $80 million worth of media value came from that media announcement and the potentially 4 billion people were reached by that announcement. And as a scientific partner to the scientific paper, the Queensland Museum said it was their most successful species announcement ever. And we're not just talking about fossils here, we're talking about every critter that they've got in their collection, basically, and this was the most successful ever. Um, and I think that museum's been around for over one century. So that was um, pretty amazing. Okay, so for over a century across the world, regional museums have been founded on major fossil localities. To date, most of the collections in Australia move out of the region to state museums. The Aramanga Natural History Museum is breaking new ground by establishing a regional museum and is still on that journey. But the parallels with the stories of development of regional museums worldwide is uncannily the same when you look at how they all started. For the Aramangan Natural History Museum, the story began with the discovery of the Aramanga dinosaurs, which has now become one of Australia's largest dinosaur collections. Since these dinosaur discoveries, the, di the museum has also dug up an impressive collection of megafauna and microfauna. Together, these three collections form the nucleus of what has been become the Aramanga Natural History Museum. After years of fundraising, preparation and construction, the Aramanga Natural History Museum finally opened to the public in March 2016 and continues to grow and develop. Thank you, everybody. Um, and again, thank you very much to Russell um, for this opportunity and, and to Jess and, and for everyone being patient enough to sit here and listen to me. And we'd love to see you all come out and visit us sometime. And please um, call me out if you come through and I'd love to, love to um, just tell me you, you, you saw this talk and I'd love to meet you. Um, so I will now stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Mel. <laughs> I get, well, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the, the, the Mackenzie family and uh, Robin, especially in, in her drive and passion to uh, help preserve Australia's uh, dinosaur and natural history in a fairly remote part of the country. And considering that uh, 20 years ago, Robin would not have had any real connection with any dinosaurs at all. And it's only taken that amount of time in which she and her team have been able to follow through and build a museum that's a world-class uh, museum and to, to contribute to uh, Australia's um, uh, rich heritage of uh, dinosaur remains. So uh, uh, it's a real credit to Robin and her tenacity to, to drive through and, and make the project going. And, and still doing it. So, yeah, thanks very much for, for your contribution, Robin. So um, I became involved when, um, well, my wife, as Robin said, uh, went out on the first sort of survey with the American paleontologists. And it's interesting because uh, when the American paleontologists, they're used to, to, in America, having outcrop where you can find dinosaur bones up in the hills so you can see all the stratigraphy and it's, it's reasonably easy to, to then discover the dinosaur bones. But <clears throat> so on that premise, uh, the American scientists who came out here saw that there was outcrop in this part of Southwest Queensland of the right age rocks that were similar to Winton. And so they thought they, they chartered a small plane, went out, and dropped in on properties, and then also uh, went out to the outcrops and climbed the hills. Um, unfortunately, they didn't find any fossil bones uh, on their survey trip, but one of the properties that they dropped into was uh, Robin's property. And uh, they showed them a piece of dinosaur bone and said, if you ever find anything like this, just contact us. And lo and behold, then so, that started a, a, a bit of a journey for, for Robin and her family to, while well, mustering, to actually keep an eye out to, to see where they could find the 
dinosaur bones. Now, the interesting fact is that uh, all companies had been doing seismic surveys across this area for, you know, 20, 30 years. And in fact, um, one of the seismic surveys actually went over one of the dinosaur sites uh, where the bones were, um, not destroyed it, but you can see the, the trace of the line, yet it wasn't recognised as dinosaur bone at the time. So credit to Robin's family for actually, uh, while they were out uh, mustering, to actually recognising what the bone was. And, and the story goes that um, Sandy, uh, Robin's son, was out one day and I uh, was um, mustering and came across this odd, odd rock, a fairly large rock that was a little bit out of place. So uh, they, <laughs> you can show their tenacity by the fact that they put this piece of rock in the back of their car and drove it 1,100 kilometres to Brisbane and then contacted my wife who and, and the paleontologists who at this time were attending a uh, exhibition of Chinese dinosaurs at the Queensland Museum. So they went inside, presented this rock and asked whether it was dinosaur and it was confirmed to be dinosaur. So that was a very exciting moment for the Mackenzie family. And that really started the journey. So like everyone who, who finds rocks or, or is interested in dinosaurs, once you find your first piece, you're hooked for life. So that's Robin's gone beyond that. Um, she's really um, creating a, a legacy here. So, <clears throat> you know, you might think it's easy just going out and finding dinosaur bones, that they should be fairly obvious. But here in Australia, it's a very different situation. We've had lots of weathering, lots of time since the um, dinosaurs were around. And the bones aren't always in great condition. And we've found that uh, unlike in America, where there's good outcrop of Winton, where you've got little cliffs and outcrop, you don't find the bones there. They're actually found underneath a, a great carpet of black soil, which covers a lot of Western Queensland. So unfortunately, you've got one metre of black soil, uh, which you see on the downs, which during summer, uh, oh, well, sorry, different seasons, when it's wet, it's uh, very slippery, very boggy, uh, and when it's dry, it cracks and it's like concrete. So you've got a metre of that above any bones that might exist in the wind formation. So it's no wonder you, you, you can't just walk around and find complete bones or skeletons on the surface. So all you're left with, as Robin indicated, was um, fragments of bone on the surface, which is a result of because the black soil is made of clay and expands and contracts in winter and summer months, that action is powerful enough to actually start um, disintegrating bones that lie underneath that surface and bringing them up to the surface. So it's quite incredible to think that um, just the movement of that soil. If you go out in Western Queensland, you, and particularly on the downs, you can see this taking place with telephone poles and fence posts sort of leaning over and some of them get pulled out. And that's just the action of that clay. So <clears throat> when up until 20 years ago, when dinosaur bones were found on the surface, uh, people thought that they were just um, transported in along the surface. So that there were just fragments on the surface. And if you didn't find the complete skeleton there, then it was basically written off as just residual uh, material. And there wasn't really much um, excavation done to follow that up. But that all changed firstly up in the Winton area where fortuitously there was a limb bone of one of the dinosaurs that actually was complete from, from the winter formation underneath the black soil and then went through the black soil and was poking out on the surface. So it was easily recognisable as a dinosaur bone. And because to, to get it out, you had to dig through the black soil and then that, that was then connected to other bones. And then it was realised that in fact, what was happening was that there was a, a, a lot of dinosaur bones underneath the surface, only a small proportion of it was getting up 
above the clay layer so that you could identify it. So there's been, that's why there's been a, um, a big explosion on dinosaur discoveries in Australia during the last 20 years. It's not, it's not that in the past that, that people weren't looking. It was just a rec recognition just recently that bones are in fact lying underneath that clay surface and that you've got to excavate that out which it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a two-edged sword because to excavate a meter of black soil over you know 100 meters by 100 meters requires heavy earth moving equipment so you, you it, it's almost becomes like a mine site but in the process you you're very cognizant that that you don't want to damage any dinosaur bones so it's a bit of a Bit of a delicate operation trying to balance removing that material and then trying to preserve the material because because the surfaces of the bones um, it's very important to to preserve the like articular surfaces because you can learn a lot of information about muscle attachments how the bones were put together etc and if you're using heavy moving equipment um, and you damage some of those surfaces then that information is lost You've also got the added factor that um, the Winton formation has suffered a lot of erosion uh, before the black soil was put on top of it. So that in many cases, those dinosaur bones were exposed to natural processes and weathering before then we come along and have a look at them. So it's very unusual to get well-preserved um, skeletal bones in the Winton formation. And, and fortunately, we've got one site that is like that. Um, this particular animal, um, Australotitan cuvarensis, uh, is, it, it doesn't have a complete skeleton. There are a number of skeletal elements there, but there's enough there for us to, to um, gather the information to recognise that it's a completely different species and that it was, in fact, uh, one of the very large titanosaurs. So titanosaurs are essentially very large sauropods uh, that... And previously, uh, they'd been recognised in South America and other countries. But uh, the significance of um, Australotitan is that it's uh, the first, it, it joins the rank of, of the truly great titanosaurs that are recognised around the world. So it's, it's a very significant uh, fossil discovery. So that's why we took such a long time uh, in, in getting the paper out. And that's the other thing people don't realize that from the time of excavation to the time of the paper, this has been something like 15 years since we first discovered these, uh, this material. And also the other thing to remember is that on each dig, uh, which we do for two weeks, there's a certain amount of material that we dig up, but it, the time, um, the process of um, working on those bones is what takes the time. And there is actually a, a, a dearth of skilled preparators uh, that can work on that bone. So the scientific papers only come out as a result of people like Robin and the preparators that can work on the bone to, to clean them up uh, so that the scientists can identify them and then either describe them to a new species or a genus. So it's, it's really a team effort. Preparators usually don't get much recognition, but they are a, a key cog in, in when a scientific paper comes out because preservation for those details is very important. Um, I mean, to the lay person, you know, a bone is a bone, a large bone, large dinosaur bone looks fairly similar to another large one but it's just the little details on it that can separate it out um, as different species or give ideas about uh, the lineage of that dinosaur. Is it associated with ones in South America or Asia? Are the Australian ones different? So the, this first paper we put out, I tried to address some of those issues, but um, we'll be putting other papers out later, but this is the first one we've, we've put out. So I'll just go through and... Um, uh, give you some uh, background on the Winton formation itself and also uh, Cooper and the scientific process of, of what we did in the discovery. Um, so 
the site itself, uh, as Robin mentioned on, on Robin's property, uh, is one, an area where the Winton Formation is present. Now, when you look at a map of where the Winton Formation is present, it'll show you that it's outcropping over huge areas, uh, including Robin's property. And if you're not there, you're visualizing, oh, there's wind and formation rock everywhere. We should be able to just walk along the surface and identify rocks and identify the bays. But this is not the case because there's this one meter black soil lying on top of it. That's not usually mentioned on the geology maps. So it, it, it is quite misleading. And you have to hone in on the areas where those little bone fragments are coming up to the surface. So as mentioned uh, previously, you can see on the bottom uh, map there, the Mad Hout anticline. It's a very large anticline. Uh, it's about 100 kilometers long. And it's, it's a folded structure where the rocks have been folded in the past. And that's also been favorable for oil and gas accumulations. So in the past, oil and gas companies have drilled there uh, to drill for oil and gas. But we've we've found that um, along that anticline, the axis of that anticline is where our fossil sites are plotted. And we think the reason for that is that uh, what happens is when those when the anticline was folded and it, and it's been repeatedly folded over a number of times, and the last time it was folded on, along the axis of that anticline was the highest point, and it was eroded. So when you see flat land like this, in the in in this area like normally you'd think an anticline would be like a big hill structure but what's actually happened is that the anticline here was here and then the the axis or the the guts of the anticline has been eroded down in the middle so you get an inverted topography where the, the crest of the anticline structurally becomes a topographic low and in that area is where you get closest to the base of the Winton formation. And that seems to be more favorable for dinosaur um, at the moment. Uh, we think um, it's hard to know, but it seems to be that the, the higher up you go in the Winton that, that we haven't been able to find dinosaur remains. So that's partly, we think the reason why we're finding along the axis there, because they're, they're about to, two to 300 meters above the top of the Winton. Um, so in terms of the site and where uh, Australotitan uh, was found, um, the original site, there's, okay, so there's, there's a couple of sites. When we describe a new genus and, and species, uh, sometimes it's one individual that we gain the information from but if we think that there are other individuals that are similar uh, and we can ascribe to, to, to that same genus, then we uh, refer them to that. And we use all that information for when we're trying to describe the new genus so that we get as much information as possible. So, so in this case, we had uh, three sites that are associated with uh, Australotitan. So the, the main specimen that, that comprises a holotype. So that's the reference uh, specimen. And then you have referred specimen. So the holotype specimen Cooper came from this area here. And then 800 meters away, we found some more elements, not of the same individual, but we referred to it that genus. And then about another kilometer away this way, there's another site that's also another referred specimen. So we, we compile the bones of those individuals to then come up with our genus description. So um, the holotype Cooper itself um, was found that the conditions of the bones uh, were not particularly good, but they were fairly complete. And as you can see, the action of the black soil has started to affect the bones themselves and uh, quite a bit of the bone is cracked and crazed. Fortunately, uh, it wasn't cracked and crazed enough for it to be lifted to the surface. That still remained intact, but there was a lot of skillful preparation work to enable that to look like it does there. 
uh, and this is the site itself in situ. So when you've got um, this, this uh, picture here is the pelvis of, um, of Cooper. Now, when you've got that in the ground in site like this, you're faced with having to, ha how am I gonna get that out of the ground? Particularly when it is, particularly Cooper, which has a very thin pelvis, how are you gonna safely cut through that plaster and get it out of the ground? So that, that was a very difficult job. In fact, we had to cut through the middle of it and then uh, reconstruct it later. So these are quite shallow sites uh, sitting just underneath the black soil and uh, took a lot of work of excavating these bones uh, out of the ground here. Um, and then we've got some pictures here showing reconstructions of some of the bone elements of Cooper with then the muscle and cartilage associated with it. So Robin was talking about, um, we're gonna have on display a reconstructed uh, version of what uh, Cooper looked like. So you start off with your bones and then you've got to build cartilage and muscle around that. And it's these points on the, on the bones here that can tell you that information. So it's not, it's not made up, you're using these reference points on muscle attachments to bones to then reconstruct things like this for your for your elements. So, and then you've got to go and um, reproduce that, 3D produce that as well. So these are the bone elements that were found on Cooper on the referred, um, on the holotype. Um, as you can see, you don't need all the elements of a dinosaur to reconstruct it because there's enough information on the general type for titanosaurs to give you a general idea. Uh, but we also used um, the referred specimens, George and Tom, which had quite nice uh, femurs. Yeah, so this is the site of one of the referred specimens um, called Tom. This was quite an exciting site because we found uh, two femurs and then a, a, a limb element, as you can see here. And, and that's as, as we found them. So that's always a very exciting moment to, to, to see this. Uh, and then there's, this is what they look like after they've been prepared. And then a lot of the work that we did in our paper was to then um, do photogrammetry and produce these in 3D and then to work out whether there were parts of the, the limb elements that were missing. And when then we were able to reconstruct a full, a full version of that so that we could get our dimensions um, right so then we can compare it to other dinosaurs around the world. The other site that we had was George. Now George was an interesting character because it in fact found the, the largest uh, limb elements, but it wasn't complete enough for it to be the holotype specimen, like the reference specimen. But it's a very impressive um, femur from, from George as well as other elements. Um, now, associated with these bones, as Robin said, uh, we've got a quite a new, unique site here where we've got a trample zone. Now, when, when titanosaurs trample the ground and mud beside a river, uh, over time, that, that uh, compressed mud turns into almost like a cement. So it forms a distinctive layer. And this is as we found it. And it represents, as you could imagine, uh, this was on the property, um, uh, cattle crossing through mud. They have this same uh, imprints of, of uh, animals coming back and forth. And that's what we see here. So it's, it's very hard to get distinct um, footprints of the sauropods themselves because the, because the mud gets distorted and this mud's splashes up like this, but um, we're going to do some further work on this to work out exactly um, what sort of sauropods were trampling through this area here. But we found two trample, uh, trample zones. Uh, so we've got one down in this portion and then one down in this portion. And this portion here was where we found uh, the, the bones of a... Um, sauropod that had been trampled by another sauropod. So some of the work that we did was to uh, retroform the 
bone that had been crushed. So it was quite, quite amazing. So this is a femur of a, of a sauropod that had been crushed by another one and the outline of that matches up quite well with the uh, imprint of the fore, fore limb of a sauropod. So we were able to restore it and then demonstrate that you could even see part of the claw on the, on the foot and then it was trampled down onto that bone. So that was quite exciting to, to find that as well. And the, the trample zone itself is, is quite spectacular. Uh, at the moment, we're having debates as what what to do with it because having been exposed, then it starts to deteriorate. Now, there was a trample zone up in Winton, you probably heard about that was because it was starting to get flooded. They decided to cut it up and move it and put it into the museum. So we've got to make choices as to whether we want to do the same or whether we want to try and preserve it in situ out here. And we've had the money and the and the wherewithal to bring this back, then it could be studied back in the museum as well. But it's it's quite a unique site because of that trampling down onto another sauropod. Um, yeah, that's just explaining that. Now, when we look at what sort of environment that the from the sediments that we were looking at that the bones are found in, um, in our area where we found the dinosaur sites. We can demonstrate from the geology that, uh, that the environment that the dinosaurs died in uh, were in floodplains with small channels and crevasse splays, lots of water. Um, if you can imagine floodplains, similar to what you see along the Cooper River system today in terms of this frequent flooding and avulsion out of the channels, but, but a very different uh, paleo environment in terms of there were lots of um, lots of vegetation because when you consider if you've got a herd of sauropods or titanosaurs in this environment, if you imagine this environment, they've got to eat. So they they they're going to be wandering around big areas and also having to feed themselves. So you've got to have the vegetation to support these. Um, dinosaurs hang on i've just flicked the wrong one here um so that's the other the other part of the story that we're trying to work out is um what was the environment and possibly what was the diet for these uh, sauropods in our area we're finding lots of uh ephemeral vegetation which means that we're, we're finding that uh during and after flooding you're getting frequent uh, emergent vegetation and you're getting lots of ferns and herbs and small sort of plants, which, as well as the uh, pine, tree, you know, the uh, conifers uh, that you see. But we're thinking that because this is quite a wet environment that's getting uh, frequently flooded, that a lot of the diet of the dinosaur here is is more to do with like uh, horsetails and herbs and ferns, the the more softer type vegetation, which is a little bit unusual, but um, that appears to be the case. And and we're only finding that uh, we're getting sauropod remains and we're not finding much other diversity in terms of animal life in this area. Um, now, as I mentioned before on the George side, uh, the, the preservation of the bone there was um, pretty poor and quite broken up. And what we found was that... Um, Whereas most of these sites were covered in black soil, in areas, some of that black soil was then cut out by small river channels, which then um, had an impact on the, the bones that were in the Winton formation. So these channels, uh, we found that within Zach and also George, we found the bones sitting within these little channels and they'd been abraded and moved and, and quite poorly preserved. So we're, we're trying to do some um, dating on the channels themselves. Uh, we'll, we've taken some OSL cores to see uh, what date this is, to see when this happened. Uh, we know it's probably associated with the last, um, within the last few million years at least. Um, 
and what effect it had on the wind information. So George, even though it had a spectacular large limb element, unfortunately was not as well preserved because of this mechanism. And we don't seem to have, this doesn't seem to have been recorded in other dinosaur sites at the moment. So one of the things we also wanted to try and do, um, how do we place our dinosaur remains in context uh, both in the stratigraphy, where, where does it fit in the winter formation? Can we date this? And how do we compare it to the other sites in Winton? So how do you do that? Are they, are they existing at the same time? So the first thing we did was looked at, because the, the dinosaur bones are found in areas like this, you, you can't use the uh, rocks or the outcrops to give you to work out where you are like you're flat out working, but that's actually wind information. So we, we, we use seismic. So seismic data shot by the um, oil companies have shown that, that the base of the wind information is very close to the surface here. And then the, the well logs that are, have been, um, and, the, and the wells that have been drilled nearby show where the wind information uh, starts. It overlies the Macunda formation. And then we get an idea, this is the surface up here. And uh, we've sort of calculated that there's 270 to 300 meters of Winton formation where our sites are located. So we're, we're sort of down in the Winton section, but environmentally, you're probably coming out of, because you go through a marine section and then you come to some uh, deltas, tidal flats, and then a coastal plain and then onto your flood plain. So that's where we're sitting in there. So we've sort of established we're about 270 to 300 meters at the base of the wind formation. Um, so then looking further afield to try and place our sites into context, what do we know about the wind formation? What's the available information that we've got? Now, unfortunately, in, in all of the areas where the wind outcrops, the maximum amount of outcrop is 20 to 50 meters. It's not laterally continuous. It's had chemical alterations. Uh, it's been covered. So what else do then do you have? You have to go to the subsurface. So when you look at core, that's either taken by government or, or oil companies. The maximum amount of core is about 350 meters of total section of the Winton. And we know the Winton's about 1200 meters. So we don't have representative section of, of all the Winton formation and not all, all that core is next to the fossil sites. So what else can we use to, to, to say, get a date for our uh, rocks? So uh, there's a technique of using zircon dating to work out the absolute age. Unfortunately, there's no uh, zircon sites that are in situ, that's to say that a volcano erupted and the material landed um, in the winter formation and stayed there as, a, as, a, as an ash layer. What we see is that uh, so far we, don't, we haven't found any in situ ash layers. And what we find is that because of the huge amount of deposition and, and channel switching that's going on in the winter at that time, that all that ash gets redistributed. So it becomes like a detrital zircon and you're not sure whether it's related to the volcanic eruptions at the time or whether it's been redistributed. So there's some problems with that. There's also lots of boreholes and seismic data, not always near fossil sites. So there's potentially a lot of information there, uh, but it hasn't always been utilized. <clears throat> So this sort of summarizes where the winter formation sits as we currently know it. So the winter formation itself is defined. Um, it's, it's got a very poor definition. It's just defined as those blue shales and thin coals seen in the area around winter, which is probably the poorest definition of a formation I've ever <laughs> heard of in my life. <laughs> There's no defined outcrop type section. I mean, by default, Lark Quarry uh, Conservation Park is, is seen as one of, the, one of the areas if you want to go and look at outcrop. And the other thing is there's incomplete preservation of the wind formation 
because of what happened after it was deposited. Um, during deposition, uh, there were volcanoes on this side of, on the eastern side of Australia that supplied material to this area, which where the winter formation sits. And that makes up the bulk of the material that the, in, and the environment that the dinosaurs are living in. So what, what you're getting is lots of ashy material that's being redistributed through huge river systems through this area. So you're not getting, and that's the reason you don't get good preservation either, is because a lot of that material is volcanogenic in the sediment and it deteriorates quite badly, like it weathers um, and doesn't preserve its structure. So a lot of it weathers to clays. That's why the bones aren't in good shape. Um, and, and most of the sediment is in fact redistributed ash and volcan volcanogenic material. So it's not very conducive for preservation. Um, and there's also poor biostratigraphic control uh, through this interval as well. So at the moment, the current thinking is that the winter formation is roughly from 100 million to, to a maximum young age of 92 million years old. Um, that's based on both biostrigraphy and also some detrital zircon data. And the other thing is how, how do you compare sites? So as Robin showed, sites from here to here, that's similar to being on the north of England to the south of England. And you're trying to resolve from just on the surface, how, how do these sites relate? So it's a huge problem um, and one that hasn't really been resolved. There's also, um, some of you might also be aware in the, uh, this area in here in Lightning Ridge, that there's been a very rich fossil record through here, uh, which contains both marine uh, fossils plus terrestrial fossils. And um, the, the, the question to be raised there, is that contemporaneous with what's happening on these sites here? Some of the zircon data seems to suggest that some of this is uh, of the similar age. And, and the reason you need to, to be able to do this uh, is to try and pin these ages down a little bit more uh, succinctly is because it then allows you to do comparisons both on the bones within Australia, but also overseas. So there's a lot of, there's a bit of arm waving at the moment on, on the Winton formation fossils and where they sit. So th this sort of summarizes uh, what's happened with the Winton formation. So um, the Winton formation after it was deposited um, about 90 million years ago, there's a great period here where Australia um, started moving northwards and you had uh, rifting off in this area and you had tilting of this portion of Australia and this created um, areas in here where you had deep weathering and chemical alteration which would have been on the Winton formation so you get you know up to 90 meters of this uh, alteration of the Winton so uh, and a lot of that is preserved on the hills and the outcrop so when you go up to those areas as, as American paleontologists found you're looking at this and there's no preservation in this material. That's this material up here. And then you had deposition of the Lake Air Basin, which is this material, this is Winton formation that's been altered. And then you had deposition on top of that, which in South Australia gets up to 500 meters thick. And during this time, you've had folding, faulting, uh, silcretes, uh, laterite profiles, and then out in the deserts, sandy position so all of this ends up sitting on top of the winter formation so uh during this time the winter formation was exposed over huge areas but since then it's been covered and altered and that's why it's very hard to find good representative uh examples of the winter and preservation of bones as well so the current uh thinking is that um the winter formation represents a system a huge river system extended from this part of Australia out near the Sundays, and could have even gone all the way to South Australia. That's one theory at the moment. And when you look at that, that's 
that's a system that's thousands of kilometers long. So this is this is like an Amazonian type system. It's a huge system. So finding scattered sites here and here, it's, it's very difficult to put them into context to each other. Um, so when you look at the other sites uh, in terms of outcrop, uh, Lark Quarry Conservation Park, most of you have probably been aware of where that is up at Winton and, and had a look up there. Spectacular outcrop. There's also um, the dinosaur stampede where you've got uh, uh, footprints preserved through here. Uh, theropod chasing other dinosaurs. Uh, very spectacular preservation and very good outcrop, uh, which shows um, the, the fluvial channels but a lot of it's chemically altered. You can see here, this isn't the original color of the rock. So this has all been um, the, the, the iron and, and minerals have been mobilized here and colored this whole section. Um, but what you see is floodplain material, channel, channel, fluvial channels up to 20 meters. There's been some zircon stated here. There's lots of plant material here early angiosperms occurring, uh, but no, at, at this site, no uh, dinosaur fossils themselves through the, through the outcrop section. So the dinosaur bones are found similar to what we find in Southwest Queensland in material below the black soil. So there's a couple of sites, one up here, um, northwest of Winton on Lovell Downs where there's been a great variety of material found, theropods, uh, ocelot, venator, crocodiles, sauropods, uh, flowering plants. Uh, yeah, a lot of crocodile material. In fact, recently one describing uh, one with some dinosaur material in its stomach. They've also got a trackway. So a lot more variety of material up, up in that northern part. So overall, the winter's got a a big diversity of uh, flora and fauna, uh, but in the south, it seems like we're fairly restricted to just uh, sauropods. And we don't know whether this is regional, um, is it climate or is it a different time? Are our sites younger or older than the ones there? So we've still got to resolve that. Um, so when you look at the depositional environment of the winter formation, um, as I said before, the sandstone is dominated by breakdown of volcanic material. The maximum grain size is medium to coarse grained. Uh, there's no conglomerates. What you find is lots of uh, interformational mud class from bank collapse, uh, but you don't actually find any pebbles of quartz in there. And then they're laterally continuous. So there's a continual switching and changing of environment um, that the rocks are telling us. So you get these frequently evolved floodplains always shifting. So you know, the next year the floods would switch over here. So the vegetation's always changing, being flooded, being ephemeral, and then growing again. And I think that sort of environment's actually quite conducive for titanosaurs surviving because there's um, ready-made material um, flourishing each year. Um, the other thing we did was to have a quick look at to see what other uh, titanosaurs are present besides Cooper. And so there's four within the Winton formation, uh, also up at Winton. And the questions are, you know, how do these sauropods relate to each other? Uh, how do they differ? Are they same age? Do they, how do they compare to the ones overseas? And then that poses the question. Uh, and, and what we found is that the Australian ones sort of sit together in a clade that they're more similar to each other than the ones overseas, but there's elements of the, of the bones that are similar to both the Asian titanosaurs and also the South American titanosaurs. So we're still not clear on whether they originated here and spread out or whether there was a mixing between Asia, South America and Australia, or whether, and also uh, what other biogeographic differences uh, between those areas. So basically in summary, summary um, the, the Australian titanosaurs seem to retain archaic traits. They don't seem to be um, 
uh, displaying any new or novel traits. So they, they sort of link back to the ancestral titanosaurs. So that much we're sort of pretty sure on. We're just not sure on the dispersal mechanism so that we're not sure whether the titanosaurs were able to get through South America, Antarctica, and then to Australia. And then the Asian connection is a lot more difficult. It could work if you get little micro continents in, in the Tethys Ocean here. Um, so there's a lot of questions still to be answered because um, we don't have enough material in Australia at the moment to be able to, to conclusively um, answer those questions. So that hopefully with the, the more discoveries we make, and we've got, we've got more material here in Aramanga, it's just that we've got to get through and prepare that material. So if anyone wants to be a preparator, <laughs> You've got lots of work that's ahead of you. So, yeah, so it's just a brief summary on, on our material and how it sort of fits on the world stage. It's very important. Like Australia is really, um, for a lot of the overseas paleontologists, they're really excited because this is new material. You've got to remember that in, in, in America and those places, a lot of the dinosaur discoveries were made 100 years ago and there's this great wealth of information from that time. So to get a new area in the world that's, that's producing all this new material is, is, is getting a lot of paleontologists excited. So, yeah, so hopefully we can contribute to the debate on, on how these titanosaurs fit around the world. Yep, so it's me. Thank you so much. It's, um, this has been so cool, so interesting. I cannot wait to tell my niece and nephew what I got to do at work today. So <laughs> thanks for making my day. Um, I'm yeah, so appreciative of you taking the time to talk to us and really do hope I get to go up and, and visit sometime. That would be amazing.